Good morning. Welcome to the uh, Center for Strategic and International Studies. My name is David Berto. I am the director of our National Security Program on Industry and Resources. Uh, with me on the stage here uh, this morning is Jesse Ellman, who is a research associate in the program and who is one of the two people most responsible for the reports that you have this morning. I'd also like to welcome our viewers on the web. Uh, thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, if you're on the web, you should be able to find uh, on, on the right-hand side of the page that has the uh, video, um, the uh, slides that we're going to be using this morning. You can download those slides. If we're true to our notes, we will tell you which slide number we're on so that you can flip through them yourself. For those of you uh, with us in the room here, the report is available, and, uh, and most of the slides are in the report. There are a couple of methodological slides and some backup slides we have that are not in the report. Uh, the report also should be available for download uh, if you're on the website with us this morning. For those of you in the room, I'd like to remind you to silence your cell phones and other uh, noisy electronic devices. I have duly silenced mine. Uh, and for those of you on the web, uh, when we get to the end uh, for questions, I'll give you my uh, email. If you want to email questions in, you can do that. Those in the room will follow our normal questions procedure using microphones. I mentioned Jesse Ellman. Uh, I also want to thank Greg Sanders. He is our uh, research fellow for much of our federal procurement data system work, for his work on this report. Uh, Meredith Boyle for organizing the event this morning, and our interns who are pulling it all off, Madison Riley, Jen Ching, Megan Dougherty, and Geneva Smith. Uh, special thanks to uh, the CSIS Homeland Security and Counterterrorism Program, Rob Wise, who is the um, uh, director or the, I mean, program manager in that program, has given us a lot of technical advice. And particular thanks to Stephanie Sanic Castro, who has been the head of that program for um, about a year and a half now. She is on a uh, well deserved maternity leave uh, with baby Catherine and husband Rich, who made it home from Afghanistan in time or just about in time anyway. He's, he's there now, so that's much more in time. Um, this is the uh, um, fourth year we've been looking at the Department of Homeland Security contract spending. Um, and uh, in that time, there have been a number of interesting changes inside it. We're going to walk you through our slides this morning. I'm going to break at about the Oh, 15th slide or so for questions. Um, I, I'm reminded of, of when I'm lecturing my students. Uh, if there are no questions, I have plenty more lecture. Um, so we'll try to break uh, for, uh, for questions about 15 slides in and uh, uh, return to the material if you want. So um, let me have the ne next slide, if you would, Jesse. Um, Department of Homeland Security, of course, was created by statute in late 2002, stood up initially uh, in 2003, so it was already partway through fiscal year 2003 at the beginning. Fiscal year 2004 is the first full year of, of DHS uh, data, both from an outlays and spending perspective and from a contracts obligation perspective. So we use this slide, if you will, to put, uh, put it in context. We've got all 10 years of DHS's history up here. Uh, and uh, uh, this uh, uh, report will focus, the report focuses on all 10 years. Our conversation this morning, though, will probably focus primarily on the last year, the impact of sequester year, if you will, um, because that's of the most interest, uh, both uh, from the point of view of historically what happened, and also to begin to answer the question, what's going to happen in 14, what's going to happen in 15 and 16. So the historical record from 10 years back is not necessarily uh, a predictor of, of the future, if you will. Um, this slide, it gives you the context for overall DHS spending. It actually, each of the bars has four elements to it. The, uh, the bottom is contract obligations. Oh, I'm on the, yeah. you've already moved past the methodology yeah. slide. Yeah. That's because, actually, I have slides on both sides of my paper, and I was skipping over the methodology slide. Um, but we're going to come back to methodology if we need to. I'll mention a couple of things along the way. Um, this slide is, is converted to uh, constant dollars in FY13 dollars. So if you look back at previous years, you won't recognize the numbers at all. They, they, that's not what the numbers look like in, in those fiscal years. But it gives you a comparison over time, if you will. Uh, the bottom, we have contract obligations. I would note that the contract obligations in uh, 2013 are the lowest total in DHS since its first year, since 2004. It's the fewest dollars obligated under contract 
uh, in, since the department was first stood up. Uh, the second is a category that we've broken out this year for the first time, and that's grant award data. Uh, Jesse, you might say a little bit about, uh, about where we get our grant data and some of the problems that we found there. Uh, we get our grant data from the Federal Assistance Award data system, which is similar to where we get our contract data, the Federal Procurement data system. The Federal Assistance, uh, Federal Assistance Award data system, or FADS, is a relatively immature database relative to FPDS. And you'll see that when we get to that data in that there's, we've enc encountered significant issues with data fields not properly filled in, data fields not filled in at all, significant amounts of, of grant awards that we know should be in the database that are not in the database. And so what we tried to do with this data is not so much analyze trends as to just set a baseline and identify issues that we think can be corrected going forward to improve the data. What we found, especially with FPDS, is as the database is used more, the data tends to improve, and we hope that's going to be the case with the grants data. For example, with the federal procurement data system, uh, beginning with uh, this administration, uh, they actually started tracking and reporting using numbers in the federal procurement data system as a means of OMB evaluating agency performance against some of the President's uh, guidances, if you will. It's remarkable how much better data get when, in fact, they're being paid attention to by the chain of command, and, uh, and we expect to see a similar dynamic coming out of FADS uh, uh, going forward, if you will. So that's our grant data, uh, and that's the second uh, element of We then break down, uh, again this year for the first time, uh, non contract outlays into two categories, FEMA and non-FEMA. So you have the marvelous title uh, of the third element of this bar of non-FEMA, non-contract, non-grant outlays. Uh, what that means is all the dollars that DHS spent that was not on a grant, not on a contract, and not spent by FEMA. And then we break out FEMA separately because, by and large, the biggest swings of difference year to year in DHS spending is in FEMA, and of course it's obviously driven by major natural disasters and, and FEMA's response uh, to those disasters. Um, from a sequester year point of view, uh, you'll notice the, the uh, uh, you won't pick it up exactly on this chart, but you'll see the differences at the bottom, if you will, of what happened between 2012, the last year before sequester, and 2013, the impact of sequester. What we had for contract obligations is a decline of about 5 percent between uh, fiscal year 12 and, and fiscal year 13. Uh, and these are obligations, not outlays. So obviously outlays lag a little bit from obligations. For grant awards, they were actually up 6 percent between 12 and 13. So sequester impact was negative there. But some of the grant awards are actually tied to Sandy, so that's not a surprise. For FEMA outlays, they were actually up 227 percent between 12 and 13. That's almost all due to, uh, was it called winter storm Sandy or something by the time it actually got labeled, if you will. I think of it as a hurricane. Um, and non-FEMA, non-contract, non-grant outlays down 4 percent. That's roughly equal to what the sequester share would be. And as you know, the guidance for sequester was everybody pays their fair share. And so by and large, that's what you see outside of that. Um, it's interesting because non-contract outlays that are not in FEMA, if you will, have been fairly stable since 2009. They're swinging only about 6 or 8 or 10 percent per year at, uh, across the board uh, year over year, if you will. So they've been relatively stable there. Jesse, you want to add anything on that? Uh, the one interesting thing to note, and which was a, li a little bit unexpected when we first approached this data, if you look at in 2005 and 2006, when you see the impact of Hurricane Ivan and Hurricane Katrina, you not only see a big jump in FEMA outlays, you also see large jumps in both contracts and grants. But if you look between 2012 and 2013, where you, where you see the impact of Hurricane Sandy, you see the big jump in FEMA outlays, but you don't see the same kind of increase in contracts or grants. What this le part of this may be just the differences in the kind of impact you saw between Ivan and, Ivan and Katrina and Sandy. But we think partly this reflects a slightly differing approach to how, how FEMA approaches uh, disaster response, less through contracts and grants, or le at least less through direct contracts and grants administered and funded by FEMA, and more through direct, through direct aid. We suspect some of this is direct aid to states, which then contract out. We suspect some of this is money transferred to other agencies like DOD, specifically the Army Corps of Engineers, which is some of which is then contracted out. 
but DHS is not doing the same level of disaster response contracting as for Sandy and in re recent years as you saw in the wake of Ivan and Katrina. One of the things I should note about data in the federal procurement data system is um, it doesn't give us the source of funding, if you will. So appropriated dollars that are in the regular appropriations for DHS are joined together with appropriated dollars from emergency supplementals, which of course tend to be the, the source of funding for hurricane relief, um, and, and we, the FPDS itself does not separate those out. Um, there are beginnings of some uh, new data that does track to appropriations. Uh, we. Uh, are going to wait until those are a little more mature before we bring them into our trend analysis. Uh, let me go to slide four then, Jesse, if you would. Um, this next set of slides focuses now on purely on contract obligations. So that's basically what we're going to focus on for the next uh, six or eight slides, if you will. Um, we array DHS data by five major components, uh, the Customs and Border Protection, uh, the U.S. Coast Guard, uh, the Federal Emergency Management uh, Agency, uh, uh, Immigration and, and Customs uh, uh, Enforcement, and uh, TSA, as well as something called the uh, Office of, uh, of uh, Professional Procurement, procurement operations, operations uh, which is a nice lumping of essentially uh, the science and technology uh, contracts and IT contracts across uh, DHS. Uh, and then we have a, a fairly decent chunk, which we call other, which is all the other little pieces of DHS lumped together, Secret Service, et cetera. So um, this chart gives you the breakdown by those five components plus uh, office procurement operations and, uh, and other. Um, one thing to note here in the year-to-year -year changes, and particularly the sequester impact changes, is the impact of a single contract on DHS. So the total contract obligation in DHS, just under $13 billion for the year, down from a high of around $15 billion. A single $500 million award for a Coast Guard cutter is a big chunk. It actually moves the needle on, on, uh, on a number of categories, if you will. So this particular year, for instance, where Coast Guard is actually up in sequester year, it's up because of a cutter. Uh, uh, which is about a $500 million contract, a little, a little under $500 million in the actual contract, but total obligations are there. So that one swing, if you will, makes a fairly substantial difference. Um, but look at the sequester impact from some of the others. So all of DHS is down about 3% in contract obligations for uh, the sequester year. If you took the cutter out of the baseline, in other words, if the cutter had not occurred in a sequester year, it's down about 5.5%. That's kind of our benchmark over the next few charts of comparing relative impact from sequester year against aggregate impact of sequester year. So with that in mind, Coast Guard is actually up. FEMA is actually up, not surprised. That's a sandy impact. Uh, Immigration uh, is down by 13%, so that's uh, more than triple what the fair share of sequester impact would be. This is contract obligations. TSA down 15%, and, uh, and Customs and Border Protection roughly average with sequester. So what you see is the sequestration impact is not evenly distributed, at least in terms of contracts, across the components of DHS. In fact, the distribution is quite varied, if you will. Jesse, you want to add anything on this? Uh, two brief methodological notes. One, you may notice that in 2010, FEMA contract obligations look particularly low. That's because FEMA had an $800 million de-obligation in that year of prior year disaster relief contracts. Uh, we haven't been able to track down, we just, uh, FEDS does not give us the visibility to track down what years that money comes from. We suspect it's, you know, related to Hurricanes Ivan and Katrina, primarily Katrina. The other thing to note with this chart and the charts going forward, you'll notice that our main number is for overall DHS is negative 3%. You may have noticed on the context chart that it was negative 4%. That's just a difference of how we look at, the, how we look at contracts. The initial chart looks at uh, con adds in contracts funded by DHS but administered by everywhere else. For all of our other charts, we're only looking at contracts that are actually administered by DHS. So from the point of view of if the Department of Homeland Security is your customer market, um, this is the relevant portion, if you will. This is funded by DHS, administered by DHS, um, not uh, funds from elsewhere. Um, so let's look at contract obligations by area. This is slide five if you're following along on the web, if you will. We break down our, our contract obligations in a way that's slightly different than the uh, federal procurement data system. Federal procurement data system basically categorizes all contracts as either products or services. 
we break out services by uh, uh, our own definitions of categories, if you will. First, we lump R&D together separately. And uh, for many areas, we like to compare products and R&D because R&D is more of an investment than it is a service in terms of where the government gains its benefits, if you will. And then inside the remainder of the services, we have professional administrative and management services called PAMs on this chart. We have equipment-related services, ERS. We have facilities-related services and construction, that's FRS. And we have medical and, uh, and ICT, which is information and communications technology. So this slide gives you those seven areas, if you will and allows you to look at the breakdown both over time by actual dollars and then the relative changes in FY13 as a result of sequestration impact. One of the relative constants is that DHS back to 2008 has been roughly $3 in services spending contract obligations for every dollar in products. And that's been almost a constant. It's ranged from like 77 to 22 percent to 75 to 25 percent. And since R&D is only about 3 percent, it roughly keeps that same even if you take R&D out of the picture, if you will. So if you're in the products business, DHS is not exactly your um, area of, uh, of future market growth, if you will. Um, the, uh, uh, within that, though, the sequester year impact was not nearly as stable. Um, what you saw was that uh, equipment-related services, facilities-related services, information and communications technology-related services were all down at more than twice the average of the sequester decline. So in terms of overall uh, 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 market share, um, all of those services areas declined uh, considerably. And then uh, by component, it varies a whole lot as well. Uh, for instance, some of the components, uh, professional administrative and management services actually went up during the sequester year. Others went down considerably. Um, some of this had to do, for instance, in the, in the case of the Coast Guard, uh, it appears that uh, um, the Congress didn't appropriate exactly all the funding they needed for uh, the cutter, so they had to go find that money elsewhere, and as a result, contract spending on other contracts went down uh, inside the Coast Guard, and you can sort of see the effect of that. Um, Jesse, you want to add anything to that? Uh, pr primarily, primarily here, uh, do we do, you'll see in kind of, you'll see in the next few slides, you'll see in the next few slides that we, we ha DHA, that there's an issue of data labeling. That isn't really an issue here because we go off of government product and, ser product and service codes. Also, these, these categories are cross-walkable with, the gov with government categories. DOD has their own categories. D DHS, I believe, ha has their own system of categorization. We can crosswalk with the gov government classification of products and services. We group, we essentially group these into categories we think makes it, makes sense from an analytical point of view to kind of reveal, tr to reveal trends that in certain segments of the market. Now we want to look at competition. So let's look at slide six. This is uh, not in your report. Uh, for those of you who do your own FPDS analysis, we provide you the uh, crosswalk from the 17 categories of competition that the Federal Procurement Data System uh, allows uh, entry into to the four categories that, uh, that we use for our reporting purposes, if you will. Those four categories are competitive solicitation with multiple offers, and we sometimes break that down into two, three, or four, or five or more. Um, competitive solicitations with a single offer, um, and, and we believe that frequently the soliciting organization has a pretty good idea that they're only going to get a single offer uh, when they do a competitive solicitation that, that has a single bid. Uh, then we do the sole source awards, which are any competitions uh, or, or that are any contract uh, uh, that are entered uh, using one of the exceptions for competition under the Competition and Contracting Act. Um, and then finally, we have uh, what we call uh, unlabeled, which basically means confusing entries that are inconsistent with one another. For instance, a competitive solicitation that was awarded but had no bids. Uh, from, from our perspective, that's a little bit of a non sequitur, so we call that category. Unlabeled, what it really is, is badly mislabeled, if you will. Um, so this is our crosswalk. Uh, let's go to the, the next slide and let's look at what the results are there. So now I'm on slide seven, uh, for those of you who have the slide deck at home. Across DHS, keep in mind, we've got roughly a 3 percent decline in contract obligations. Um, uh, discounting for the uh, Cutter Award, about a 5.5 percent decline. So that's kind of your benchmark, if you will, in terms of competition. What we saw in sequester year was a very significant jump in sole source awards. 
uh, a 15% growth in a single year as contract obligations were actually declining. In fact, uh, sole source awards in, in DHS have gone from about one-seventh of total contract obligations back in 2009 to two-sevenths of total contract obligations in 2013. Um, however, that was done in part because of a decline in uh, competition with a single offer. And we believe there's actually a correlation there because an awful lot of times uh, you, you actually know you're only going to get one bid. If you wanted to go to the trouble of a sole source justification uh, uh, for uh, a, a sole source award, you probably have the basis for doing so under a SECA exception. And what looks like probably happened in DHS in 2013 is in fact a recognition of that and, uh, and a, a movement in that direction, if you will. Because if you look at the, the total award uh, combination, if you will, of no competition, of sole source awards and competition with a single offer, it was 44 percent of total contract obligations back in 2009, those two categories together, 45 percent of total contract obligations in 2013. So there's a fair element of stability in that regard, if you will. Where we did see uh, the increase, if you will, was in competition with, uh, uh, with, with uh, uh, no, three to four offers, where the chart shows zero percent difference, but keep in mind overall contract obligations down about five and a half percent. So that what, what you saw, what you would expect to see as a result of sequestration is in fact more competition in the areas where competition was already in place. And that's exactly what you end up seeing in this uh, area here. In places where in fact there's only a single source, you see less competition under sequestration. Um, Jesse, you want to add anything? Uh, you'll notice the bottom bar for unlabeled. Back in 2009, that was almost $2.7 billion, which was a not insignificant, that was 15, per, that was 15 or 17 percent of total DHS contract obligations. We couldn't identify the degree of competition because the data labeling was not there. They've made significant strides in that effect, to that effect. It's down to less than 2 percent. What we've seen is, mo what we suspect uh, is that as unlabeled has gone down, there have been increases both in no competition and competition with five plus offers. This is a bit anomalous in most agencies we've looked at when the data labeling has improved for competition, just uh, no competition has increased as a, uh, kind of concurrently. So what we, what we suspect is that the unlabeled was masking both some no competition and some highly, competi some highly competitive contract awards, oddly enough. Uh, the, other thing to, the other thing to note here is that this is not, this is not a coincidence. Uh, the Chief Procurement Officer, Nick Nyack at D DHS, has a team that looks at the DHS entries every single day. They pull this DH the FPDS entries from DHS every single day, looks at them over a certain threshold to see if something looks, something looks off, some data, is, some data is mislabeled. And as a we suspect as a result of this, they've made very significant strides in the quality of their data entry. Right, I, I think, thank you, Jesse. It's worth pointing out uh, uh, we've seen tremendous results in, uh, from that in our data as we've watched over the last few years. Uh, and, and Nick Nike and his team deserve a, a shout out uh, in that regard. Um, let's, uh, let's go to slide eight now. This is another methodological piece, if you will. You won't find it in your report. This basically walks you through the 17 different FPDS categories of, uh, of what we call pricing mechanism uh, to the uh, five categories that we use, fixed price, cost reimbursable, uh, time and materials, combination, and unlabeled. Now, uh, a word of caution here. Combination in, in the guidance for the Federal Procurement Data System entry, and keep in mind, every one of these contracts, 700,000 contract actions a year are being entered by a human being sitting down at a computer entering data into the Federal Procurement Data System. Basically, what combination means is you have a combination of contract line item numbers of CLINs, some of which are a fixed price in their basis and some of which are cost reimbursable. And it's too hard for the enterer to determine which of the two categories they should be put into. That doesn't mean that in the fixed price category there aren't some contracts with CLINs that are in fact on a cost reimbursable basis or that in the cost reimbursable category there aren't some CLINs uh, that, uh, that are fixed price. It's the predominance of the uh, uh, expected obligations that, uh, that drive this, if you will. So the, but we believe that over time these differences tend to mask themselves from trend analysis point of view so they don't actually skew the trend data one way or the other. Let's go then to, uh, to slide 11. I'm sorry, slide 9, right? Yeah. Um, 
So if you look then at this uh, basis, you'll see, and again, using the sequester year uh, of a minus 3 percent as your benchmark, um, fixed price contracts dramatically increased as a percentage of total uh, DHS spending in, in uh, sequester year, uh, up 5 percent in terms of contract obligations between 2012 and 2013, as overall contract obligations were declining 3 percent. Cost reimbursable down 18 percent in that time period, time and materials down 10 percent. This indicates to us a very serious push for fixed price uh, contracting across DHS. Um, the anecdotes that we've heard from the companies in the business uh, uh, certainly reinforce that, if you will, a lot more focus on, on fixed price contracts uh, as part of this. Uh, pretty dramatic reduction of the, in the other categories, but they're so small that they don't even show up on the bar graph. So, um, uh, so that the 56 percent reduction in combination uh, is round, rounds off to not much difference one way or the other, if you will. Um, we also look at, at spending or contract spending by contract vehicle, uh, slide 10, if you will. And here we break down into a variety of categories. Um, the bottom one with the blue part with the $2.7 billion is definitive contracts. That was up 10 percent year over year. Uh, however, keep in mind there's a $500 million contract for a cutter in there, and so that skews that number, if you will. Uh, purchase orders, which is only down to about $300 million now, declined by 10 percent over the year. Uh, single award uh, IDCs uh, up 3 percent, and this is actually a huge chunk of DHS spending across all components now. Uh, multiple award IDCs down considerably. Um, now, we think this is actually the result of obviously thousands of task orders being issued on these, on these IDC contracts, and so there's no, no one particular set of actions that, uh, that drives these numbers, if you will. And, uh, and significantly less spending now uh, on, on the federal supply schedule, down from $4 billion uh, three years ago to $3 billion last year. Jesse, you want to add anything on that? Uh, with both this chart and the last chart, you, all, you, again see, you again see the improvements in data quality and the decline in the unlabeled, which were, the, which were at the bottom. Uh, one note on the, on the last chart, the contract pricing mechanism chart. Uh, the decline in the unlabeled was, you know, concurrent with a rise in fixed price contracting. We suspect that the unlabeled and the combination were masking the degree to which there, there was fixed price contracting within DHS. Uh, also note that the increase in fixed price in 2013, a lot, the cutter was awarded under a fixed price incentive fee contract. So part of that increase was due, was due to the fact that you had that $500 million contract for the cutter. Thanks. Let's go to slide 11 now. We also break out our data by contract size because, and, and we actually have uh, in, in the backup material uh, some interesting uh, analysis of the levels of competition based upon contract size, and, uh, and we may bring that up before we uh, finish here this morning. Um, starting at the bottom, so we've got basically the, the six categories of contracts are under 250,000. And keep in mind, federal procurement data system captures theoretically every contract action of $2,500 or more. Um, so that this is about a, a billion dollars uh, in, in FY13, uh, down about 10 percent year over year, so slightly bigger than average, about double the average of what, uh, what the sequester impact would be. Uh, contracts between 250000 and a million, down 6 percent, roughly its fair share of, of sequester impact. Similarly, with contracts between 1 and 25 million, which is half of total DHS contract obligations fall into co contracts of that size, one to $25 million. And that's spread almost equally across all uh, DHS components in terms of, uh, of the uh, volume of contract actions of that size. Um, about $3 billion uh, in the 25 to $100 million category, and this actually was flat year over year, uh, which basically indicates that it did very well under sequester impact with, uh, with no negative impact uh, at all. Um, and then the $100 million to $500 million range, a substantial drop, 29 percent drop year over year. Uh, this is about three or four contracts is all it takes to create that level of, uh, of fall, if you will. And then, of course, you can see on the top um, the orange Coast Guard cutter in 2011 and the orange Coast Guard cutter in 2013. Those are your only greater than $500 million uh, contracts uh, uh, since Hurricane uh, Katrina back in 2006, if you will. Um, we then look at vendor size, slide 12, if you will. 
Uh, we break down the size of vendor into three basic categories. Uh, one is we call small, and that's uh, any company that uh, is, the data are entered into the federal procurement data system using a small business set aside category, if you will. We track this by DUNS codes, and so we actually have cases of some vendors, you know, hundreds of DUNS codes that we sort out and align with the company, if you will. Uh, we define large as any company, the amalgamation of which all of their revenue from all sources, government, non-government, domestic, and, and international, is $3 billion a year or more. And then we define medium as everything in between. Now, this is a little bit misleading because a chunk of your medium-sized companies are those that have just graduated from small business category and are clearly not a, a billion dollar a year company. Others are in that, you know, 500 million a year, billion dollar a year, billion and a half dollar a year range. And, and they're clearly a very different type of company, especially in a DHS market, uh, than a company that's just graduated from small business. We're wrestling with that methodologically in terms of how we might proceed going forward, but, uh, but our trend analysis for years has been into these categories. And then just for convenience sake, we break out uh, what we have been calling the big six. These are your largest federal uh, contractors, if you will, Lockheed Martin, General Dynamics, uh, Boeing, Northrop Grumman, Raytheon, and BAE Systems. Um, and so we break those down. Uh, even inside uh, the Department of Homeland Security, uh, they have a non-trivial portion of the total contract spend. It's interesting what happened in sequester year, though. Uh, small businesses essentially stable, a decline of 3%, which is roughly their share of a 3% overall decline. Uh, medium business actually gained a bit, up 1% for the year. Um, so a slight improvement in the position overall of medium-sized businesses, even as sequester spending was down 3%. Large businesses actually also did a little better than average, uh, with a decline of only 1%. Uh, and the biggest impact was in the big six, where they lost one-fourth of their uh, dollar value, if you will, uh, in, uh, in FY13 as a result of, of sequester. Uh, I think if you went back one chart, Jesse? Yeah you'd see probably a fairly high degree of correlation between that significant drop in the $100 million to $500 million contract range on this slide and go forward yeah. and the uh, reduction in, in fact, the share of the big six. I don't think we've done the contract by contract comparison, but I suspect you'd see a, a high correlation uh, between those two going forward. Um, so let's look at the vendors now. Uh, I should add here from a methodological point of view the federal procurement data system lists only prime contract dollars. We do not have good public data that allows us to break out subcontract dollars. And so these numbers do not match what companies report as revenue. In fact, they don't even come close to what companies report as revenue. They are, however, what the public data says the prime contract dollar value obligations were uh, for the top 20 DHS vendors. Uh, we've got actually four sets of data here. On the left-hand side, we have the top 20 vendors in 2008, ranked 1 through 20. And then next to it, we show their dollar obligations in 2013, uh, constant dollars. Then we also show their 2007 rank, so you can see the change year over year between 7 and 8. Then on the right-hand side, we have the top 20 vendors in 2013, and we show the 2012 rank and the amounts associated with those as well. Turn to some of my notes on this chart. Um, one interesting point, of course, the, the, the companies do change, and they change in part due to the types of contracts being awarded. When you're only awarding between 12 and 15 billion a year, a single large contract can move you up or down this list fairly rapidly, if you will. The second thing you would see, particularly if you had, for instance, the 2006 list, is you see a huge impact from contracts as a result of Hurricane Katrina. Those are, are gone, and you don't really see much of a Sandy impact uh, in, the, in the 2013 list or a Sandy impact in changes from 12 to 13. This reflects what uh, Jesse pointed out earlier, is that the response to Hurricane Sandy was largely not in the form of contracts. It was much more in the form of direct spending or of money uh, transferred to other agencies. Um, what you do see, though, is that the share of the top five in 2008 was about 43 percent, that $2.441 billion of their obligations in, uh, in 2008 uh, was about 43 percent of total DHS spending. By 2013, uh, oh, I'm sorry, that's the share of the top 20, so the top five share of the top 20, not of total DHS spending. By 2013, the top five actually had 51 percent of the top 20 total contract obligations. So you do see a bit more of a concentration amongst those top five. I would note, however, that uh, the top five have all changed 
uh, in that period of time. And so I wouldn't read too much into that, if you will. Um, the other thing is the overall share of, of DHS contract obligations that are gathered by these top 20. It was 37 percent in 2008. It's 36 percent in 2013. That looks like, from the point of view of a market, a fairly stable and, and competitive market uh, going forward, if you will. Um, let's turn now to slide 14 uh, and, and look at grants. Jesse, you want to describe our, our grants data a little bit? So what we've done here, uh, all the FADS database ha uses the catalog of federal direct assistance assignments for program titles and program numbers. We've taken each of the grant programs within DHS and assigned them into purpose categories, with the exception of the Homeland Security Grant Program, which is a grouping of, of several large grant programs within DHS. That gets its own category because it's so, because it's so much money. We've grouped them into counterterrorism and infrastructure security, disaster preparedness, disaster response, transportation security, and other, which is just a catch-all for a few small programs. One thing to note here is that several of these programs have elements within them that may cross over into two or more of these categories, but the FADS database doesn't give us any visibility beyond the top level, beyond the top level program of any sub-programs within that grant program. So we've done our best to assign these programs to one or more, one of these categories based on what we felt investigating it was the main purpose of that grant. Be aware, though, that there is some money that could be, that could be classified into two or more of these categories. What you do see, what you do see here, uh, and the one thing that we'd, we're, we're hesitant to do, trend analysis, there are some very serious data gaps, the ones we identified primarily with the Homeland Security Grant Program. You'll notice that in 2010, the Homeland Security Grant Program disappears. That's not because there was no money. There was $1.8 billion in awards for the, for the Homeland Security Grant Program in 2010. In, the, in FADS, there was negative $1 million in awards. We, just, yeah, we, we have no indication that they stopped awarding money under this program in 2010. The data is just missing from the database. Similarly, in 2012 and 2013, about half of the awards under the Homeland Security Grant Program, about $300 million to $500 million in each year, are just missing from the database. Based on this, we're hesitant to, you, to do any sort of trend analysis because we're just not confident that the data in the database is robust and complete. But we, what we are doing is using this as a baseline to go forward to A, track improvements in the data, and B, ju just see kind of where the money is going. And the one thing you will see is the vast majority of grants within DHS are, do go to disaster response in one form or another. I should note that DHS is fully aware of this. They're working on it, and we expect that uh, by the time we stand up in front of you next year with our uh, DHS contract trends report, uh, this will have been um, uh, fixed, at least to the point where we've got numbers that seem to match reality. Um, so it's, uh, um, we're excited about that possibility. The things we get excited about here at, at CSIS are somewhat small in nature sometimes when it comes to uh, contract and grant data. Nonetheless, what this does is uh, allows us to get a picture first of uh, how much money is going into these uh, grant programs. And they've changed dramatically over time, and Congress continues to fiddle with the boundaries of the programs and their purposes, if you will. And if we look at uh, slide 15, uh, you'll see who's getting them. So if, if you're in the business of, uh, of working for a state or a local government in a disaster area, you're excited to see these numbers. If you're actually trying to pursue new contracts, um, these are pretty meaningless to you because although almost all of these recipients then turn around and spend the money, a good chunk of this money is spent under contracts. So as a secondary market for uh, businesses, it's a very large market, if you will, but it's not a very concentrated market, it's not a very centralized market, and it's not a very market that you can target, not a market that you can target very well uh, from Washington. So um, let me pause there. Uh, let's see. In fact, why don't you go ahead and put the next slide up? Yeah, this looks like a suitably uh, a good place to pause. Um, we do have some additional material we could walk you through in terms of level of competition by component. Uh, in terms of contract size by DHS component, 
uh, and contract, competition by contract size and size of vendor. But, but let me pause there and invite uh, uh, questions, if you will. Um, if you're in the audience here in the room, you want to ask a question, just raise your hand. Uh, one of our uh, um, staff will bring you a microphone and you would, uh, in fact, uh, speak into the microphone, identify yourself and your affiliation, and then ask your question. And we'll do our best to respond to it. Uh, anybody have a question? If you're watching from the web, you can email them to me at dbertau at csis.org. And, uh, and I'll pick the good ones and we'll uh, work. I like, I like questions by email because I can filter them a little better than questions from the room. Let's start uh, on the back here, if you would, uh, Geneva. How are you doing? Dan Kanuski. I'm at the Homeland Security Studies and Analysis Institute. It's a federally funded research and development center. So my question is, did you consider FFRDCs in your data collection? Thank you. I do, FFRDCs, if I recall correctly, and Greg, please correct me if I'm wrong on this, would show, would show up in our, in our list of, in our list of top vendors if they made it into the top, if they made it into the top 20. Uh, we don't break out that data separately, but, you know, you know, the, data, the FEDS data with some work would, would theoretically allow us to identify contracts going to the FFRDCs. In, in addition, we have looked o over time uh, at the uh, award there and it, the contract, competition contracting exception, of course, is pretty diligently followed uh, in that regard. That's uh, uh, not only true for, for uh, DHS, HSSAI, but uh, for FFRDCs across uh, government contracting. So. Um, but it's probably not worth breaking out separately because it's not a significant enough portion that it skews the rest of the data, I don't think. Um, I, the, you know, there's, a, there's often a, a debate uh, as to whether uh, spending with FFRDCs, federally funded R&D centers, uh, should somehow be uh, uh, spent in, uh, uh, in open competition with other sources as well. Uh, every study that I've been on that looks at that uh, finds a very strong, valid area, if you will, of uh, of uh, reason to maintain separate federally funded R&D centers and other similar entities across the, the government. The issues are all on the boundaries and the edges rather than on the core question, if you will. So, uh, other questions in the room? We have one up here in front. My name is Joe Cudahy. I uh, am a consultant with McConnell International Consulting on DHS Affairs and and the DHS alumni. And I was wondering if you were able to look at the effect of the significant delays to the Eagle II competition in DHS contracting and how it might have affected dollars spent in one year or another, and perhaps how it uh, led to uh, uh, an increase in uh, no competition activities. One I, of think the, you, I think you mentioned yeah. I think you mentioned that you only looked at DHS uh, contracts that were administered by DHS and not other parts of the government. And I think there was a significant movement away from DHS contracting to other parts of the government with the delay in Eagle II. The, I, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, there certainly was evidence of that in a lot of the stories that were in the trade press at the time. Um, the difficulty of tracking that in the federal procurement data system is often um, it will not have the actual contract that was used, if you will. You've got, you can track back by, by contract number, but the, the transactions, if you will, of going from an individual contract action inside FPDS back to the original contract and particular at decisions that were made to use that as opposed to a different one, um, I think is probably a little bit beyond our analytical reach with the, uh, with the staff and the time that we have. Um, but I think it's a very valid question. And it's one of, one of the interesting dynamics, uh, particularly in the services contract business, is uh, the individual impacts that particular decisions are having in terms of either delays or decisions to use uh, other vehicles, if you will. I think that's a question we'll take a look at for, uh, for our next version. Um, I should also point out that uh, we'll have significant additional data posted on our website, if you will, uh, following the release of this, and our plan this year is to update that regularly as the year goes along uh, rather than wait. The cycle time for data, um, you know, the fiscal year starts October 1st. Uh, typically, the federal procurement data system 
updates for the previous fiscal year are relatively mature by about the end of the calendar year, so about a three-month lag time, and we start doing our analysis, if you will. Uh, there is one exception to that. The Defense Department doesn't actually even begin. It has its data internally, but it doesn't begin making the data publicly available until uh, after 90 days, and that lags us behind a little bit, if you will. Um, but inside the Federal Procurement Data System, there is constant change of data entry and constant updates, if you will. For instance, the Coast Guard Cutter uh, contract that we talked about here when we initially began doing our analysis in February uh, was listed as a contract for radio equipment. Um, now, I'm delighted that they're buying radios, but it was hard for me to see $500 million worth uh, in, in a single year. Um, it turns out it's a radio equipped platform. Uh, uh, that uh, the $500 million contract was for. So we, we, we watched that closely, but I think your question about, uh, about the, uh, particularly the delay in, in the Eagle Award is a valid question. I'm not sure we can get at it, but we'll take a look at that. Let me uh, um, turn to a couple of the charts that, that I think I want to break through, go through here very quickly in terms of the additional breakdown. Uh, Jesse, if you could flip through this. These are, uh, these are not in your report. Um, but they are in the charts, I believe, that we yeah. posted on, on the web. Um, so what we have is, is contract obligations by component, uh, by level of competition, if you will. And the, the, the colors, uh, if you will, the, the darker red is no competition, and the darker blue is three or more offers. So what that allows you to do is to see the two ends, if you will, of, of competitive environment. Uh, that is, sole source awards and, uh, and multiple offers, three or more offers, if you will. What you see with the Coast Guard is, in fact, uh, a dominance of those two categories. There's either a lot of competition uh, in terms of uh, the total uh, percentage of, of money being spent, uh, roughly 40 percent in 2013, or there isn't any competition at all. Again, roughly 40 percent of contract obligations is non-competitive uh, in, in the Coast Guard. Much of that is, in fact, the cutter. Uh, the next slide, slide 20, uh, in FEMA, you see a, cat a, a categorization, I think, that you'll see over and over again, if you will, um, which is, uh, again, in the middle, you see single offer and, and uh, sole source awards. Uh, at the very bottom, two offers, and at the very top, three or more offers. Next slide. You see uh, somewhat of a parallel dynamics with immigrations. Um, you see a, a very substantial amount, over 50 percent of contract obligations by ICE uh, were three or more offers. This is a highly competitive environment and, uh, and has skyrocketed in the last three years uh, in terms of immigration and customs enforcement. Uh, uh, I have to reflect back. I think this is about uh, a, little over, a little under $2 billion total contract obligations. So, so, so it's a very competitive environment, if you will. The next slide. Uh, TSA, uh, equally uh, a very competitive environment, dramatic increase in, in competitive solicitations with three or more offers. It's now over 50 percent of TSAs, uh, slightly more than a billion and a half dollars, if you will. And in the Office of, of uh, Procurement Operations, which again is S&T and, uh, and IT contracts, uh, again, you're, you're over 40 percent in terms of competitive environment. So once you get away from the big sole source uh, contract awards in, in CBP, which are actually not large, there's a lot of small sole source awards in CBP, and the large uh, sole source awards in Coast Guard, you see a very, very competitive environment at the component level uh, across uh, DHS, uh, similar with the other DHS category in slide 24. Um, looking at, at the size of contract by component, again, uh, these are in the, the order, I think I'm on slide 26 here. Yeah. Um, uh, CBP uh, contract obligations by size of contract. You see the vast majority of CBP contracts are in the million to $25 million range, uh, roughly a billion dollars a year, and in the 25 to $100 million range. Uh, and since 2009, almost no contracts over $100 billion. I should note that CBP has never awarded a contract to any of the firms that we labeled as big six in, uh, in our chart of, of the major uh, government contractors. Uh, Coast Guard, uh, again, a uh, huge chunk in the million to $25 million range. Um, the larger contracts tend to be driven by individual programs and individual years in which they're spent. Uh, next slide, slide 28. Um, FEMA, um, uh, by and large, is in the uh, categories of uh, the one to $25 million range, keeping in mind that FEMA contracts are down considerably, and much of FEMA's response to Hurricane Sandy was in direct spending. Uh, next, uh, immigrations, uh, uh, again, the vast majority in the $1 to $25 million contract range. Um, and if you go back and compare this, 
uh, you'll find uh, that the levels of competition, that is, the three or more competitive solicitations uh, or competitive offers against uh, solicitations, are by and large in this $25 million and under contract range. Similarly, with TSA on uh, slide 30. In fact, I think you can skip past the next couple because they're pretty much the same. Now we look at level of competition by size of contract. I'm on slide 34 for those of you following along at home and not necessarily at home. You're probably in your office. I suspect you've put on a coat and tie to watch us this morning. Um, if you look at level of competition for contracts under 250,000, uh, you see the pattern that we've seen elsewhere. Um, either a lot of competition, that is three or more offers, uh, and over 30 percent of total uh, contract obligations in this category or in that, or in fact a very large number of contracts with either a single offer or a sole source award uh, in the 20 to 30 percent range, if you will. That's uh, for small contracts. For the 250 to 1 million, uh, 250,000 to 1 million, which is slide 35, you see the same pattern, if you will. Uh, the single largest share is in competition uh, with three or more offers, uh, and the smallest share is in competition with, in fact, only two offers, with the sole source of the single offer in between. Uh, similarly, for contracts one to 25 million uh, in, in, in on slide 36, for contracts of 25 to 100 million on slide 37, this was actually a bit of a surprise to me because I expected to see a difference uh, based upon the size of the contract in terms of the level of competition. Where it begins to break down is obviously when you get to the really large contracts of, of $100 million or more, where a single contract award or a single contract that has only two bidders can skew the data considerably, if you will. And, uh, and on the level of competition for contracts over $500 million, obviously some years they're none, and other years they're a single source award. So um, that's almost not worth the chart, but in the interest of completion, uh, we look forward. Then we look at size of contract by size of vendor. So this is where are you going after if you're in the business, if you will. I'm on slide 41. This is a little tough to read from where you are um, because of the changes in colors and, and the scale, if you will. Um, by and large, what you see is a pretty high correlation between uh, small businesses tend to dominate the contracts of, uh, of uh, uh, under a million dollars, uh, have the largest share, roughly 50 percent of all those contract obligations are going to small set-aside businesses. Um, in the one to 25 million dollar range, you see lar essentially a really large competition uh, or, or share between small businesses and medium-sized businesses. And it isn't until you get to the contracts of 25 million or more that large businesses begin to dominate in terms of share. None of that is counterintuitive, um, and in fact, is exactly exactly what you would expect. Uh, there's not necessarily any policy guidance in that regard, uh, but it's interesting to see the data by and large support that, if you will. Um, then we look at level of competition by size of vendor. Uh, I'm on slide 43 here, and as you can see, more than half of all Com uh, all contracts awarded to small businesses have three or more bids. Very competitive environment. Next slide. For medium-sized businesses, it's equally competitive, but only in the last couple of years. There's been a dramatic increase in terms of, of uh, competitive solicitations with three or more offers. It's now over half of total contracts obligated to medium-sized businesses. Uh, then on slide 45, uh, large businesses, here you have a much bigger dominance of, of in fact, sole source offers. Uh, uh, nearly 40 percent of all contract obligations to large businesses are sole source awards, and another 15 percent are single offer competitions, if you will, uh, and a little bit of a decline in terms of competition, both uh, with two offers and with three or more offers for large businesses. And then the uh, big six, the largest, defend the largest government contractors, if you will, um, shows uh, actually a surprisingly competitive environment. Uh, uh, well over half of, of uh, dollars awarded to, large, to the big six are awarded with two or more offers. And uh, that was a bit of a surprise to me. This is not dominated by sole source obligations. So that's a quick tour through the kinds of data that you'll see, not necessarily in the report, but that you'll see in additional charts and data on the website, if you will, and we can break that down. We're happy to uh, not only take questions now, but, uh, but as you go through the data, we're happy to take your emails and questions on what's inside here as well. And, uh, and we wish you all great success in, in uh, increasing your share of this declining market. Um, any other questions or comments? Let me check, make sure I've got none on the web. 
and we've got a couple, but I think we've already covered one of them, and the other I will answer separately offline. So thank you very much for joining us this morning.